Welcome to PhD with Women on It, Hack the Future. My name is Beata Young, and today's PhD, Positivity Hack Delivered, will be by our guest, Dorian Minzer. Topic, embracing your bonus years as a time to grow, learn, and evolve. Episode 92 starts here. Let me remind you, this is a grassroots community that focuses on women on IT, an inclusive forum of women in technology, startups, and female leaders who are supported by men as well. And I bring heart to that hassle because empathy is my mojo. And empathy is critical when you are embracing your bonus years as a time to grow, learn, and evolve. If you're thinking about retiring, the question of when is never far from your mind. But what if you could be retired and still grow, learn and evolve? It's no, not all just about hanging out at home all day, looking after the garden. It's about taking advantage of every moment in your life that comes with a bit of extra time on your hands. More people are living longer. And with that comes the opportunity to engage in life in some new and exciting ways. The concept of retirement is changing, providing new ways to think about shifting from work and or active parenting. With these bonus years, we have a more extended middle age to use our gifts and talents in ways we never thought possible before. Positivity Hack Delivered 92 guest Dorian Minzer is working to empower people to confront and recognize societal ageism and internalize ageism. Dorian is a retirement coach, consultant, and popular speaker. She combines her personal and professional experiences as a therapist, coach, and teacher with expertise in adult development, life planning, and positive psychology as she works to help people navigate the second half of life. Dorian, let's start with a simple question. Where in the world are you? Where are you delivering on positivity hack from today? <laughs> I am currently in Massachusetts, in um, right outside of Boston, in Brookline, Massachusetts, in the USA. That's fantastic to hear. You're in beautiful location. I'm streaming. It's not live. Thanks to the slow flow. I mean, slow because we applied for flow internet in our location in Grand Turk, beautiful by nature, the Turks and Caicos Islands before Christmas. We only got cable delivered to us two weeks ago. Anyway, flow, I hope you're going to flow faster. <laughs> and today's recording is going to be pushing forward the retirement age. And don't slow down, people. Listen to us. Tune in to hear some stories. And here is my story. I have to tell you that both of my parents retired quite soon. I mean, quite early. Uh, my father retired when he was 62, my mother when she was 60 uh, in Poland, I'm from Poland originally, and I remember one morning my husband woke me up shaking my arm saying, there is something wrong, there is something wrong, and I woke up and I was like, what's wrong darling, and he said, your mom is not in the garden. Because that was how she spent her retirement age. She was just not even saying hello to us. She would go straight into the garden early in the morning. And all we could hear is the whistle of the water uh, when our garden was watered. Well, Dorian, what do you say to those uh, children? I mean, adult children mm -hmm. who want their parents to strive and enjoy their retirement age? Well, I think there's a lot to think about. Um, as, as you were saying, and it's true, we're living longer. 
and the whole concept of retirement is changing. Um, and you're not retiring from life and it's not all downhill after you reach a certain age. So I think it's important if you're an adult child to help your parents know um, connection, engagement and purpose and meaning is important for all of us. And I think even for your listeners themselves who might be thinking about retirement for themselves, it's, it's no longer just a destination. It's a transition. It's a journey. And I think having the connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning can be gardening like your mother. Uh, it can be, there's no right way, which is so wonderful. It's like allowing yourself to just think about what are things maybe I put on the back burner? What are things I never had time for when I was working full time or active parenting? What are things I still want to learn and know and grow into? Um, it, it's really important to think about that because, you know, as you said in the introduction too, it's really a longer middle age that we have and it's important to embrace it. It's, it's a new beginning if we let ourselves and it can be very much garden, being with children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, still working, using your skills in a different way, volunteering for pay. There's no right way. There is no right way. There is no wrong way either. Um, I would say I was quite disappointed that um, my mother-in-law didn't really feel happy about looking after my child. But as the time progresses, I can feel her struggle. She just didn't find it exciting to look after the grandchild. Um, my parents looked after my daughter. However, the frustration was real. There was no set boundaries and I became dependent. My mother became dependent on me as well. And that really was breaking our bond in a way because it was difficult to raise your child without you know overstepping certain boundaries or causing some friction in a way so um what are different ways what would you advise to those uh, adult uh, children who want their parents to look after their children what would be your number one advice to them well it's it's an interesting question you raise um and i think it's a setup for the importance of having conversations um, and expectations of each other. What's so interesting is that you, as the adult child with children, may really envision that, oh, you know, my parents are retired, my mother's got more time, they'll take care of my children. It is important, I think, to respect and recognize that's not going to work for everybody or not work full time for everybody. So it's important to talk about it so you don't let each other down. Some people really have ideas of other things they may want to do during retirement. And if you don't have these conversations and figure out what you're each expecting from each other, it's a, a potential of disappointing each other from the get-go. Um, and again, with the sense there's no right way, it is important to be respectful on both sides. I mean, it may be that you've spent years waiting for your, you know, your parents to retire with that assumption. Um, but I always say assumptions get people into hot water. It's really important to talk about what you want, what they want, and what might be a way to do it. It doesn't mean rejecting you if they don't want to be full time taking care of your children. It just may be that, you know, there really are some other things that they want to have time for. Um, so I think it's important not to put judgment on it, um, but to clarify expectations. Absolutely. Honest discussion leads to great um, family life. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out to our viewers today, in the USA, if you retire at 65, you have a 76% chance of living 10 more years. A 38% chance of living more 20 more years and 5% of living another 30 years. The life expect, expect, expectancy for men in the US is 78.54 years. Women tend to live longer than men generally and have a life expectancy of 81 years. 
<coughs> excuse me. So what would be the advice for, well, I'm still not in the, uh, that group. I mean, I still have lots of plans. I'm an entrepreneur. But what would you say to those who are nearly at retirement age? And what would be your advice? How to prepare for that transition? I think, first of all, I think it's really helpful to recognize that, as I said before, retirement isn't a destination anymore. It is a transition. So I, I recommend to people, think about how have you handled transitions in the past? You know, all transitions have an ending, sort of a period of unknowns, or sometimes people call it the messy middle, and then a new beginning. So think back to maybe when you started school or you started work or you got married or had children or didn't have children or marriage, divorce. Think back to the transitions. Do you have more trouble with the ending, with the period of unknown, with the new beginning? I think that's helpful and it will initially then inform you on where you might have more difficulty right now. And it is helpful to let yourself try to think ahead of what your vision is. You know, if you're not working or if you're not working full time, um, what would be your ideal of, you know, how you would like to do it? Do you want to still work? Do you want to use your skills in a different way? I think it's helpful to take time and figure out what are your strengths you know, were you able to use your strengths in work? Um, and if so, great. Are there some strengths that you are aware that you really never were able to develop that you might want to think about developing more in this next phase of life? That's great. It's helpful to kind of plant a seed and just think about, you know, what, what would keep the juices flowing in you? What would help you just feel alive? And to begin to think ahead of time, if you can let yourself, um, to plan for this next stage of life. There are retirement coaches. There are often programs around, lifelong learning programs. Um, I do think thinking ahead and planning ahead can be very helpful. Uh, we can't control everything, but just gives you a sense of realizing, you know, there's this long, hopefully, period of life ahead that you can embrace. And, but you can design it yourself. You can really figure out what's important rather than just have it defined by other people. Sometimes people end up just deciding, well, you know, I'm burned out. You know, it sort of depends on are you retiring by choice? Are you really tired? Are you, you know, burned out? Uh, or do you want to keep working? And I think it's important, you know, sometimes people just say, I really just want to stop. And there's a honeymoon, honeymoon phase, and that's fine. What I find, though, is that if you haven't figured out what's going to give you connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning, uh, oftentimes people then come in and say something's missing. So think about transitions that you've handled in your life. Also think about the role work plays for you. Generally, it's a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Generally, it's camaraderie. It's self-esteem. It's a sense of the connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning. And active parenting provides that too. So think about how are you going to build that in your life? It doesn't have to be as structured as, you know, when you were working. But it is important to think about what's going to get you out of bed in the morning. What will give you that connection, engagement, purpose, and meaning? Beautiful, uh, Dorian, and you say it in such a calming uh, voice. And now I want to disrupt our audience with a very tricky question, because if you ask average person, what do you do for a living? They start talking about their uh, occupation. And um, I actually heard somebody being asked, what do you do for a living? And he said, I breathe. So the question is for entrepreneurs, because they are driven by entrepreneurship, they have to wake up in the morning, they have to hunt for a new client, they have to find new ways of developing products, they have to find new technologies. And I strongly advise our listeners or viewers to tap into the new world of technology. I wouldn't be a woman on IT if I didn't preach here. However, apparently, a Shell study found that people who retired at age 55 were 89 
more a percent more likely to die within 10 years than those that retired at 65. Men that retire at 62 had a 20 percent higher likelihood of death than the general population. People feel broken when they retire because they lost their sense of waking up in the morning, going to work and feeling the purpose of living is doing your job. Now, as you lined up our preparation for retirement age, what examples can you give as a meaningful and purposeful way of living? What routines do you recommend? Um, I will mention some routines, but I think one thing that I think is really important for people is to realize we are more than just what we do. So our work identity for men and women can be really front and center. But what I do recommend is to try to think about the other parts of your identity so you take that with you. And I think it's helpful to think about what are you retiring to? Um, and again, it doesn't have to be retiring to more work or definitely, you know, or volunteer work or whatever for money or not for money. But what are you retiring to? And to think about the other parts of who you are so that it isn't just totally a sense of loss, but with a retirement, there is some grieving, but it's like, what can you let yourself look forward to? Who are you besides just what you do? And many people talk about kind of shifting from the work role to thinking more about your inner life, your inner soul. And it's helpful to give yourself some time to think about that. And also to confront some of the issues about ageism. I mean, we live in a very ageist society. Um, particularly in the United States, but I think in other parts of the country, although in some places, elders are more revered. But to let yourself think about what's the wisdom and perspective that you have from your years of experience, whether you're an entrepreneur or work for other people, what have you learned? What are your skills? What are your strengths? How do you want to give back? How do you want to be remembered? What's your legacy? And what are the other parts of your identity. I think the getting older, if we can allow ourselves to look at it, is a time to get more whole, to integrate a lot of these parts that we maybe didn't have time to develop before, to become more whole. So it's not just growing older, but becoming more whole. Life expectancy was shorter, like in my parents' generation. But now, as you know, you pointed out, people can live 20, 30, 40 more years age 85 and older is the fastest growing segment of the population. You know, in our generation, in the 21st century, the expectation now is that we're going to live and have these bonus years, that we're going to live longer. Back in my parents' generation, it was the exception when people lived longer. But what's important is to think about still being vital and connected and that connection, engagement and purpose and meaning that I mentioned before. Otherwise, there can be this dark side where you kind of go down this rabbit hole and you feel like you're invisible or you feel like you're worthless or you feel like you have nothing to offer or you're not needed. So it's so important not to let yourself go down that rabbit hole. That's when there can be, you know, people can spiral into depression or drinking too much or drugs uh, or suicide. Um mm. But it doesn't habits. have to be that way. It's, it's like being able to recognize we can change how we view life and to realize that society may say, you know, you're out, you know, put you out to pasture or whatever the expression is. But don't internalize that. You know, it used to be that with the, eight, the paradigm of aging, it was like all downhill after the traditional retirement age of 62 or 65. It's not that anymore unless you buy into it. Um, now, with these bonus years, this kind of vast, vast plateau out there with a lot of hills and valleys doesn't mean it's going to necessarily be easy. 
growing older, you know, it's harder and our bodies change and what we can do change. We might have to change our dreams, but we still need dreams. We still need to believe in ourselves and recognize that we don't have to be invisible, that we have a lot to give. And I think being connected intergenerationally with people older and younger is so important. I have a number of friends older than me that um, I learn from and I have people younger that I learn from. I think intergenerational connections help us stay vital and alive, knowing you've got some wisdom and perspective to share, but there's a lot that younger people can help us you know, understand and develop and it, it adds a richness to life. Oh, absolutely. It, it's like uh, being a mentor and also learning from your mentee. Um, the way of new living so that right. generational gap uh, can be no right. longer that uh, visible uh, now you touched upon a couple of pointers here and I can't stop but think about the intern the movie with Robert De Niro fabulously playing the intern right. of a certain yeah. age approaching Anne Hathaway who didn't believe right. in the strength of this old right. man who comes in a funny way with a very overdressed fashion. Uh, what's your take on that? Uh, do you advise <laughs> people doing interns if possible? It's a great question. I love that movie. I actually saw it again not long ago. Um, and I, I recommend it to people. Um, yeah, I do think internships, mid, sometimes they're called midtermships, and they're different places that have it. Some of the universities, uh, Stanford University, uh, University of Minnesota, I'm not sure which university in Minnesota, it might be University of Minnesota, Harvard, a lot of places have internships for older people or minternships. Um, interesting, an organization called Encore.org uh, has just changed its name to Cogenerate um, mm -hmm. with this idea of intergenerational connections. But, you know, as in that movie, which is really delightful, this man was a widow, a widower and, you know, had worked and he just had lost his sense of direction, connection, engagement, purpose and meaning. And so he went and, um, you know, to be an intern with all these other young interns and having young bosses, Anne Hathaway. And it's a beautiful example of kind of that holding back sometimes, not passing judgment, but but eventually really recognizing, you know, there's a lot you have to share and give, um, but to find ways to do it. There's actually a, a, another book um, that I would recommend. It's, it's called The Making of the Modern Elder by Chip Conley. Mm -hmm. um, he had developed 52 kind of boutique hotels, sold them. And then he was hired, I think he was around 50 when he was hired, um, to work with Airbnb, and he realized he was 50, and uh, younger uh, people were his bosses, and he thought, you know, who's going to need anything from me? But that whole concept, as you just mentioned, Betta, of, in, you know, uh, mentorship, uh, sharing his wisdom and learning from other people, and it led him to develop this whole new entrepreneurial uh, approach, which is called the Modern Elder Academy, which is in the United States. Um, and actually I was just at a workshop. I, I you know, I, I, I see a lot of synchrony with what, how they approach things and, and the way I work with people. And it's a wonderful way to really think about becoming a modern elder. Think about what your wisdom is, what skills, how to work with younger people. Um, how can you use your skills in a different way? you know, learning about transitions, all the things I've been mentioning and realizing a new phase of life is just beginning. And it's really exciting if you let yourself view it that way. It can be a time for writing, a time for memoir writing. It's so much not an all downhill. And I'm a believer. I don't like it actually when people say 60 is the new 40 or 70 is the new 50. I think 70 is the new 70 and 60 is the new 60. Let's value being older because there are a lot of, um, of, of experiences. There's resilience, even during COVID, 
you know, there have been really some interesting research that older people dealt with it better than younger people because we've gone through a lot of ups and downs in life. And it's, I think it was much harder for people at home, you know, with young ki kids who weren't in school. Um, interestingly, there's also a happiness curve, um, <laughs> which is interesting to think about that people are happiness kind of as babies and then as older people. And part of that is really recognizing that as we get older, there's less angst of, you know, potentially having to work so hard to earn a living or raise children if we're so lucky to have them. Um, and it can be more just this gratitude and appreciation of life. So, you know, I, I really do think confronting internalized ageism, thinking about becoming more whole, developing that kind of resilience muscle, um, and letting yourself really, you know, forgive yourself, forgive other people, lifelong learning, um, I, I just think all of this just can make this new stage of life pretty exciting. Mm. I just uh, searched uh, the author, uh, The Making of a Modern Elder, Wisdom at Work, How to Reinvent the Second Half of Your Career by Chip Conley. Is the book recommended by our lovely guest. Thank you so much. I didn't know about him. I didn't know about his great initiative, a Modern Elder Academy. I need to check it out. Now, check it out. Absolutely. Now, um, you yourself um, have the purpose of talking <clears throat> about the ageism and, and preaching to people to plan their retirement age. Was that the purpose that you uh, fulfilled recently or have you planned it out long time ago before even coaching became a mainstream? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, I've been working, my first degree was actually 50 years ago. Um, and I've always worked with people in life transitions and in, in an interesting way, in some respects, it's, you know, it's sort of, I've morphed as my own life transitions have morphed. Um, and as I approached middle age, um, I began learning more and more about adult development, about positive psychology. And I'm one of what has been referred to as um, the leading edge boomers. So I was of the generation that was, we were all turning 60 back in, I think it was 2006. And so at that point, I began thinking more and more about hmm, kind of what is this adult development like? We're living longer. Uh, retirement isn't what it used to be. You know, my parents both died in their 70s. I'm in my, I just actually had another birthday just the other day. So I'm, I'm in my later 70s now. I'm still working. Um, and part of my passion I, is to help people just figure out what's right for them. You know, I consider what I do as sort of portfolio. I do some coaching, I do some therapy, I do speaking, I've done some teaching, I do writing, um, a combination. For me, that, that fills me up. And I think it's just helpful to think about yourself and what your skills are and kind of what you want to do and how you want to do it. Um, I work mostly now with people in the second half of life. That's evolved, I think, over the last... Um, 15 or so years. I mean, I shifted into coaching about 20 some years ago um, and was working with people in life transitions. And then sort of quickly, um, I ended up really shifting to second half of life. Although I don't just work with people in second half of life, I like also working with you know, again, intergenerational. So I'll work with, you know, young couples or couples trying to start having families or communication issues or changing jobs. But I think there's something so rich about this second half of life because it's such a changing paradigm. You know, it really isn't all downhill. And we need to work hard not to internalize um, the... Um, you know, all the negative feelings about being invisible and being irrelevant. We have a lot to share and give. And I like to help people recognize that. Um, you know, there's, there's this encore we have, these bonus years. If we keep learning and letting ourselves um, 
you know, really evolve and change. As you know, I said, it, I mean, it's a time to grow, learn, and evolve if we so choose to design this second half of life. Mm. Ah, that's a great pointer now to add a little quotation here. You know, you're getting old when you stood, stoop to tie your shoelaces and wonder what else you could do while you're down there, George Burns says. Now, we are talking about retirement or second half of life. When do you recognize you're entering the second half of life? Well, that's an interesting question, which keeps changing. I mean, it used to be people thought about middle age as 40 to 60. Now people are more thinking about middle age as maybe 50 to 75. Um, and some people may view that they're moving into the second half of life earlier. I think you mentioned at the beginning, you know, there's some people who, because of life circumstances, retire earlier. Um, and they're able to do that. Um, so I think Partly second half of life is a self-definition. I mean, it can be an age, but it's a stage of life. So perhaps when children are, if you've had children, you know, they're more launched now. You know, you're not, you're still a parent and you'll always be a parent, but it's not the act of parenting. Or you begin to realize that there's just more things in life that you want to do. And you're aware that there's less time ahead than behind. And so you know, sometimes a decision about retiring in whatever phase, whether it be stopping work or phasing out or working part time or doing something else might be tied in with that sense of awareness and urgency that, you know, none of us are going to live forever. And the, I think it's important to, to try to, as best we can, control the parts we can so we don't at the end... Um, end up feeling like we have a lot of regrets. So it's, again, tied into that gratitude and forgiveness and realizing you have things to offer um, that I think is really important. Mm, absolutely. Speaking about the importance of ageism, how we can tackle bias, as we know, there is lots of, uh, apparently, I didn't know this term, grant fluencers. Grand influencers. Do you know oh, some influencers. and uh, influencers of uh, grandparents' age? So right. uh, it is it is the influencer marketing. Um, uh, you know, because usually people at retirement age they have more time. They also have more money to spend. They don't spend it on their children. They don't have to support their children financially. So they are a target for many companies who want to uh, reach out to those of wealthy um, and who can influence uh, the buying market. So um, why is ageism such a big issue? Why do you think... It is, uh, you know, invisible age for people who are of certain, uh, you know, middle age or past middle age um, life period. Oh, that's a hard question. I think there's so much um, just societal ageism. I think there's a lot of fear of getting older. Um, I you know, I think there's a lot of fear about death. I always have said sex, money, and death have mm. been taboo topics, although I think that's changing somewhat. But I do think that's an underpinning of it. I think people are really afraid of losing autonomy, getting older, um, maybe losing cognitive capacities, um, bodies letting us down. I mean, there are some negative parts of aging. However, studies also are saying that there are really ways we can take care of ourselves to age as best we can. There's a piece of research I always like to share, which is by the time we're 65, it's 30% genetics. And that's big if, you know, there are genetic components that you have. But it's also... 70% of things you can have some control over, things like nutrition, things like exercising your body and your brain, 
things like meaningful relationships, things like focusing on positivity, things like lifelong learning, things like intergenerational connection, you know, and being part of community. All of these things are things we can have some control over. You know, we're not going to control, you know, that we're not going to die at some point. I mean, that is going to happen, but we can control how we live. And I do mm. think that's so important, you know, to, uh, to the best of our ability. And people age differently. But I think that there's been a lot of fear of getting older and death. I think that <clears throat> we have lived, <clears throat> as you were pointing out, in a very youth-oriented, you know, um, climate um, society. But you're absolutely right. People in the, quote, boomers and beyond population <clears throat> Are, are big consumers and spending a lot of money. And there's more recently been a lot of marketing and trying to figure out what people, you know, 50 and older want and people also into their 70s, 80s and 90s. And there's more centurions. Kids born today have a 50-50 chance of living into their hundreds. You know, it's a, in, in, we're an aging population. And I think that, you know, society is trying to figure out how to catch up with it. I mean, we used to have this traditional retirement age of 62 or 65, and that's when people died, you know, seven, eight, 10 years later. Now, you know, you shared those statistics earlier. You know, now there's the potential of 20, 30, 40 more years. That's a long time. We might have a longer amount of time post-retirement than we had during the working years. Um, and that's a lot of time to, you know, and important to figure out what's going to keep you vital and engaged and kind of keep the juices flowing and keep you as active and healthy as you can be. Do you have uh, an influencer? Do you have a role model of a certain age that you like to bring our attention to? <clears throat> so there are a number, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, I have a number of role models um, that are older than me. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one, <clears throat> What actually is maybe, my husband? Maybe you, oh. you catch your breath. I'm going to tell you who is mine influencer. Ooh. Iris Apple. <laughs> she is over 100 years uh, old. Yeah. And she her Instagram is followed by millions of yeah. followers. She teamed up with H&M. She has got lots of contracts. And I would love to look, look like her. And one of the questions I have in the back of my mind, because I think ageism is much harder on females versus males. And uh, yes, uh, well, we are judged by the age. We are still very uncomfortable to talk about our age. And I think it's very important for females to be open about how old they are, because I don't believe in the fact that you should hide your age or you shouldn't ask a female because we are living in equal opportunities at time. And why can't you ask a female how old is she? Uh, whereas you can ask a man how old he is. Well, again, that's part of the stereotype. But let me first answer about some of my role models. Um, Excellent. My, my husband actually is one. My husband's 90. A physician. Mm. He still works a day a week. Um, we've had to change some of our dreams because he can't do altitude anymore. So we hike in non-altitude areas. We ride e-bikes, you know, these e-assist mm. bikes. And this summer we started playing pickleball. And, you know, I mean, COVID limited some traveling, but we're starting to get back to traveling. So he's one person. Another person who I so admire and love is a good friend of mine, uh, Jan Hively, who is now 91. She got her PhD at age 69. And she has started um, many, many different programs that still exist. She um, has one of the more current organizations that she co-founded is called the Pass It On Network which is a global organization with the idea that there are really a lot of programs around for people in the second half of life and nobody has to reinvent the wheel. So people share ideas. It's kind of a clearinghouse and they have programs, but the idea is you pass it on. So, you know, nobody has to reinvent the wheel and you, um, you know, we learn from each other. 
Uh, there are also other people in the field that are, you know, who maybe are a few years older than me. As I said, I, I'm late, my late 70s. I just actually turned 77. Um, Richard Leiter is somebody who's done a lot of work on purpose and meaning. Um, he has a number of books. And one of the more recent is Who Do You Want to Be When You Grow Old? Um, there's a lot of really wonderful people out there. I encourage all of you who are listening to think about and and respect and think about what is it you respect about them that may also help you you know think about how you want to be and how you might want to be a role model for other people um i know i find it just very rewarding when people tell me that i'm a a role model for them um and i feel good about that it is interesting, though, that men who are older are often viewed as distinguished and handsome. And women, you know, there are a lot of issues about women and, you know, how we age. And there was just recently in the United States a, an anchor woman who ended up, because of her gray hair, uh, losing her position. You know, there, there's really sexism and ageism. Um, that we have to contend with, unfortunately. Um, but I do think it's important to be aware it's there, but to be an advocate. You know, you can be a role model. That's the one of the books that I put down was this book about a mindset. Um, and I think it's so helpful to, to think about what does it mean to have a growth mindset? You know, so often we might have this fixed mindset, which is that you know, we become irrelevant, we're not needed, you know, we're not attractive anymore, we're, you know, all it's all downhill. But if we can sort of recognize that we don't have to have those stories, you know, we really can have a, a mindset that, you know, we really can accomplish and we have more to offer and just being um, and, and connecting with people and sharing stories is so important. You know, we can't change events that happened in our life, but we can change the meaning we let them have and we can change the stories we tell about them. You know, rather than perhaps just as an example, being a victim, you know, you can think about what happened and how you've learned from it, you know. I mean, and embrace it. I would say, exactly. you know, uh, the mindset of age is just a number, is one off. Of course, I do not advise uh, running like you were running in the early age and uh, jumping of the parachute. Um, not everything is uh, for everyone. You have to be mindful of what your body is capable of. Uh, we can't change that, unfortunately. However, with practice, I have to say that my mother-in-law... Um, who unfortunately doesn't want to reveal how old she is, but I can assure you she's over the age of 70. She still plays tennis. She used to play tennis twice a day. Now she plays once a week and uh, she plays. Um, and at one stage she actually <coughs> had an injury and she was thinking whether she could play with her left hand because her right hand was injured. So I do advise uh, our viewers, our lis listeners to disrupt ageism and really think about positive outcomes and think about what you can do with all that time that you are given. Now we are heading towards the end of our lovely discussion. And since you mentioned internship, or midternships, um, I have to bring some other statistics that impact females, because as we know, there is a big um, gap in terms of earnings, and women have smaller retirement savings overall, with an average of $57,000 saved in US compared to men of 118000 A third 33% of women have no retirement strategy. Of those women who do have a retirement strategy, just 24% have it written down. Single, senior Hispanic women are the most likely of all senior demographics to live in poverty at 32%. So if that doesn't convince you to plan your strategy, 
Uh, I think you need to listen to this show again because Dorian shared some amazing um, books. And now I'm going to ask you, Dorian, what is the number one book you wish everybody read before they started their second half of life? Oh, there's so many books I could, you know, I, 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 when I knew that this would be a question, I had a whole bunch of books on my list, but I did choose a book that's just out now. Unfortunately, it wasn't out before, but it's tied into something I mentioned, which is about mindset. It's by Carol Dweck. Uh, it's called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. And I think it's a very helpful book because I think it helps us think about positive psychology. I think it helps to think about having a growth mindset, kind of what is success, developing self-confidence. I think self-confidence is often a, a, a difficult thing for women. I mean, I know I grew up in a generation, you know, where it was very, very difficult. Um, I got so many different messages. I mean, I was told in eighth grade during a science presentation, don't be smart, you won't get a husband. I mean, you know, luckily things I think have changed since then, you know, but I think we're st it's still an uphill battle. So I think a mindset, I think kind of trusting ourselves, connecting with other women and men. I mean, we can learn from men, women and men, older and younger, finding a way to believe in ourselves, uh, getting help when we need it. Um, and learning about our strengths, our character strengths, how to use them more, how to be more conscious and intentional in how we live our life. Um, but there are a lot of wonderful books out there. But I think this one, which is a relatively new one, um, is helpful because I think I, I, I do think it's often more of a up, uphill battle for women. And I think it's important to, you know, just really have a growth mindset and really believe that we um, we have to persevere, you know, we have to, you know, kind of advocate for ourselves, listen well, listen actively, ask questions, be curious, um, and, you know, connect positively, you know, with the world so we can make a difference. Mm. Age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter, as Mark Twain <laughs> said. <laughs> now, Dorian, um, we touched upon many base points. Uh, I think the important thing is having a routine. And you mentioned about your um, advice on the routine, what makes your life uh, purposeful. Um, is there anything else that we have to be aware before reaching that time that we have to prepare apart aside from the money aspect? Because we know that, for example, females, not only they have lower savings, but quite often they live longer. So that means you may end up impoverished and dying in poverty at the certain age. So what else would you think is a sound advice for all our listeners? I think a few things. I think because we're living longer, um, it may be important not to have this magic age in your mind of when you're going to stop working. Um, I know it's harder sometimes to find jobs when we're older because there's ageism in the workforce. That's beginning to change. Um, and there's listings of companies that are better for older workers than others. But I think it may be important because we, none of us want to outlive our money, you know, to think about working longer. Um, as I said, you know, I'm in my late 70s. My husband's 90. He still works a day a week. I, I still work. Um, and it is helpful to just think about how to position yourself. I'm also a believer that no matter how much or how little money you have, it is helpful to talk to a financial person who has what I like to think of as a holistic approach. So it's not just the number that you need, the amount of money, but it's really thinking with you about how do you want your money to work for you. Um, and so that may help inform you about you know, maybe, you know, you do need to work longer and to accept that as a piece of reality so that you don't outlive your money. Um, mm. The other part that, um, and I just lost my train of thought, so let me just let it come back to me for a second. Um, it's um, 
really time the for more... another quotation then okay. aging <laughs> it's not lost youth but a new stage of opportunity and strength by betty frieden that's another good quote and so <laughs> kind of thinking about the money but thinking now too about who are you how do you want to live your life? How do you want to be remembered? And to start trying to do those things now. I also think it's helpful to think about, you know, I know it's a, it can be a difficult question. I think it's a profound one. Um, George Kinder, who um, was one of the first, I mean, I think he was the guru of financial life planning, has a series of questions. And I modified the last one a little bit. But if you were told you only had 24 to 48 hours to live, what would you regret not having said or done? And then come back to now, whatever age you are, and think about going forward, what are things that are important for you to be aware of that you want to build into your life now? You know, we don't know when the end's going to be. Hopefully it's a good long life. But it is important, I think, to, to prepare for it, to have important conversations, to, you know, talk with people older or younger, you know, make sure... I mean, this gets into some things also about preparing for this next stage of life. Really make sure you've got a record of all your passwords and accounts. We live in a digital world and a real world. Um, it's, a, it's an act of love and liberating, actually, to, you know, have people at least know where you've got everything listed and to keep it up to date. Um, because at a time of crisis, it's really difficult if the survivors are left not knowing you know, what somebody wants or where the keys are or what the passwords are. So there's sort of thinking, thinking in a generous way, too, of how do we maximize the time we have, but be realistic, kind of an optimistic realism that we're not going to be here forever and to control the parts we can, you know, so that we yeah. can, you know, live as fully as we can. So I think dealing with finances, but dealing also with your sp spiritual life, you mm -hmm. know, letting yourself recognize, I mean, it's not unusual as we get older. I mean, some people may have had a sense of spirituality throughout, but as we get older, there often are these questions, what's it all about? Mm. You know, what, what's life about, you know, if you're yeah. in a relationship, who am I, who are you, who are we, you know, but Absolutely. let yourself well, think about these things, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, speaking about thinking and rethinking, I think we have to remind our viewers, no matter their age, that you have one life. Don't waste it on regretting it. Exactly. And as my favorite uh, role model, who is preaching for ageism, and she's advocating for women of all ages and minorities and for diversity, Cindy Gallup says, don't look back. You're not going that way. One life, no regrets. Let's go, Dorian, into the end of our show questions. What is your life lesson quote and how does it impact you? Again, I came up with a number of quotes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, but the one, I, the, what I have on my tagline on my email is actually Ananis Nin, which is life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. And I really like that too. But the one that I chose, you know, to really highlight today is Mary Oliver, um, a wonderful poet who died in 2019. She has some wonderful poems about life and nature and death. And in her poem, The Summer Day, she says at the end, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? And the quote that I particularly like is, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Um, so that's the quote I guess I would like to leave you with. Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? You know, it's there for the creating and making, you know, and we can, des as best we can, to control the parts we can, try to design it and try to recognize it is not all downhill. And through our last breath, this role model I mentioned to you, my friend Jan Hively, she says, meaningful work paid or unpaid through our last breath, which is, I think, and that can be weeding a garden. It can be reading. It can be being with children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, volunteering, working, whatever. 
having a sense of connection, engagement, and purpose and meaning, um, and really being genuine with people and just knowing, you know, as long as we're alive, we have a lot to learn and a lot to give. Mm. Imagine the pandemic and travel restrictions are over and you can pick any person in the world to travel anywhere in the world and have private mm -hmm. breakfast with. Who would you choose and where would you go to? We were talking about this before. And I mean, there are a number of people that I had on my list that aren't alive anymore, uh, such as Viktor Frankl, Man's um, Search for Meaning, and actually Dolly. Dolly Parton, she's a wonderful role model for women in terms of business and life. Um, Maya Angelou, Mary Oliver, but of a living person, I actually picked Gloria Steinem. She was that met much, not that many years, but you know, within a decade of my age. And I think that she was just um, such a, an important person for women. Um, uh, claiming our voice and claiming our space. So I think I'd love to sit down and talk with her and learn more from her and um, <coughs> sort of more about her journey. And I mean, I happen to love New York, so I would be quite happy to meet her in New York or just on a wonderful beach. Um, it can even be in Massachusetts or it can be in the Caribbean or just a wonderful beach where we're both warm by the sun, a gentle breeze, listening to the waves, and really just talking about the journey of life and what's important and empowerment for women, empowerment for people, you know, for Under minorities. Under one condition that you're going to invite me to that breakfast, Dorian, <laughs> I have a perfect okay. beach for you, beautiful oh. by nature, Turks and Caicos Island in Grand Turk, where I am currently located. It's going to be marvelous to talk to you because you've got such a charisma, so many great plans and many people can learn whether of retirement age or young age or we have actually um, our lovely production team members saying how great this uh, conversation has been for them and I can assure you they are definitely not reaching the retirement uh, age anytime <laughs> soon. Now, Dorian, there is a great quotation that I like to challenge my guests with. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, women are like tea bags. We don't know our true strength until we are in hot water. In life, how are you in hot water? How are you brewing, Dorian? I was just typing something here. Um, I think we get energized by hot water and diversity. And I, I want to be a tea bag that just, you know, um, fills people up. Mm. <laughs> um, and that, you know, helps calm people, but help people think realistically and positively about this next stage of life. I mean, that's sort of a, passion mm. that I have so <laughs> there you go if you want to uh, be filled with passion and love Dorian has a message for you there is a free webinar please over to you thank you so I just wanted to tell you on the fourth Tuesday of every month except December at 12 noon eastern time um, like New York time Boston time I have a free webinar. I started it in May of 2012. So I'm into my 11th year. And the sign-up's always the week before at my um, website, revolutionizeretirement.com. It's free. You get a recording link after the call. And I've met so many wonderful people and read books. And it's my way of giving back, of bringing these experts to you to be able to listen to and learn from. And then in celebration- Join Dorian, of we cannot extend our gratitude oh. to Dorian. Thank you so much as always. Our positivity quote comes from positive thinking only and goes, look for something positive in each day. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, 
change your attitude. Maya Angelou said, and Dorian, I know you also recommend her. This is it from today's episode. Join us next week, Wednesday, 12 p.m. CE, uh, EST, 6 p.m. CE.